How's it going, guys? My name is Chris. Uh, everybody knows me on YouTube as Mr. Kristoff. I'm a uh, cryptocurrency YouTuber. I'm a Bitcoin miner. I'm a bit of, bad, a, bit of a bad boy in this space, uh, like fast cars and motorcycles. Um, today, our discussion's about uh, monitoring blockchain, not just for the IRS. And for many of us who are in the cryptocurrency space, this is a subject that we find very precious to our hearts, the idea of monitoring blockchain. We all, most of us got into this because of the beauty of decentralization. So I figured today we'll kind of tee off on some of that, some enterprise use, and also let's go ahead and step into the uh, government conversation when it comes to uh, monitoring uh, blockchain. So today we've got Sean, Aaron, and Irez. I'd like to give you guys each an opportunity to introduce yourself and what you guys do. So uh, I'm Sean Douglas, uh, CEO and co-founder of Amber Data. We're a blockchain and digital uh, asset data platform. So we basically aggregate blockchain data across to all of the major blockchains and across all the currency exchanges and provide transparency into activity on chain and trading and value and, and really enable people, anybody to access you know, blockchain and crypto uh, market data. Hi, I'm Aaron Klein, uh, founder and CEO of Blockwatch. Uh, we, we actually come at it probably from a different angle than maybe some of the other folks up here. We're looking at it from a, an enterprise network monitoring perspective, looking at how we can help enterprises adopt blockchain, leverage up. We're doing, you know, we're, we're collecting data and, and doing analytics around everything from operability to uh, configurations to security monitoring, really painting a picture of what's going on from, from sort of endpoint to endpoint on the chain and making it really easy for enterprises as they adopt the chains, as they, as they look to move more and more to blockchain to be comfortable doing it. Hey, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Erez. I'm uh, running the US uh, office of Blocks, Blocks.io. Uh, we're the leading uh, accounting solution uh, in the space. Um, tracking and running full nodes on our end, uh, APIs to exchanges, exchanges custodian solutions, uh, Coinbase of the world, everything uh, in order to help finance folks uh, of crypto companies to handle their uh, crypto assets. Very nice, guys. Thank you for the introduction. Let's go ahead and dive in and have some fun here. All right, so to start off the discuss discussion, my first question is the ability to track a blockchain comes with both controversy and praise. The banking industry and financial industry is also met with both dynamics. Tell me how utilizing distributed ledger technology could change banking as we know it, and what would it look like? Yeah, so I mean, I think if you think about what's happening with cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's it's an open financial system that is global that's going to touch every person on the on the planet, right? So um, as products become securitized and distributed on global platforms, or as you know. Um, adoption of, of projects that are in, using cryptocurrencies or smart contracts, it, it's, I think it's, it's a matter of time before it happens and it's going to happen globally. So I, I really think there's underlying technology here that's going to enable that to happen. Gotcha. Aaron, you get me? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think you're right. I definitely think that's sort of an, an ongoing trend of what we're going to see. I mean, I think in sort of the bigger picture, as you see that happen, right, you see sort of ease of commerce and you see, you know, a, a whole new wave of liquidity sort of rushing through the commerce as things are tokenized, just as you saw things securitized in, you know, sort of the, the 80s, 90s, 2000s into why interest rates are where they are. You're going to continue to see sort of a push down in interest rates. You're going to see an increase in global commerce as you see this occur. And, and I mean, I'm, I'm certainly with you that I think this is a trend and, you know, it takes the friction out of global commerce. Yeah. And just to add to that, um, you know, thinking about it, banks are using systems 40, 50 years ago. Um, definitely think that there's uh, room for improvement uh, and more transparency in the, in the system. And yeah. Well, here's my next question. If banks were to utilize blockchain technology, right, which would be a distributed ledger technology, <clears throat> what would what, how would you ensure security and accessibility to such a such a chain? I think that that's one of the amazing things about what's happening with blockchain and cryptocurrency is it enables radical transparency. If you look at the traditional financial markets today, 
you know, who you're interacting with, what's happening in the dark pools, what's happening on in your clearing houses, what's happening in your counterparties. There's no transparency. There's very little transparency. But with blockchain, there's pretty radical transparency. You can see on exchange, you can see on chain, you can see those flows, you can see the interactions with the mint and burn functions on stablecoin. I think it really opens up all of that. It becomes a much more trusted uh, transparent world where you can actually, because blockchain is about delegating trust to a consensus <laughs> protocol and enabling transparency. So, you know, it, I think it's 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 pretty interesting times, right? It takes away all the dark corners. Yeah, <laughs> takes away all the dark corners. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah. So, so I actually I probably have a slightly different view of of this. I think when we see banking, when we see that industry adopt blockchain, and I think we are seeing fintech do it. I think it's, they're gonna be permission chains. I think there's still gonna be control. I think there's still gonna be a fair amount of anonymity. I do think it takes the friction out, right? And I think it takes out that middleman and it makes some of that easier. But I still think, I don't think it's gonna be, be transparent. I think the banking in, institutions, and I think what springs up in its place is gonna to continue to want some control. They're gonna want some, some input and some understanding of who's attaching to their networks. They're not going to want to have large financial networks that are, that are susceptible to attack. They're not going to want sort of that uncontrolled, uh, you know, sort of the wave of folks joining and running transactions. So I still think there's going to be a fair amount of control around it, and I think there'll be a fair amount of opaqueness. I just think it'll take out, it'll take out a lot of the costs of transacting today, and, it'll, and I think it'll speed transactions. But I don't think it'll necessarily make it visible. So you don't necessarily think they'd have the same levels of transparency that we do with our traditional blockchains? No, I, I, I mean I am certainly of the of the opinion that we're going to see we're going to see adoption, but adoption you know adoption of like Quorum, which is which is a Ethereum with an overlay of security and an overlay of control and permissions on it, and I think that's what we're going to see come through. My next question to extend on this is do you think the world is ready to have banking on a blockchain? Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, I think that we're in 2019, we definitely see um, a lot of the infrastructure starting to, to kind of uh, lay out and a lot of projects are starting to deliver their, their projects. Um, I'm not sure that we're quite ready, but we're definitely in the first stage of uh, of having it, uh, 2020, 2021, uh, definitely, uh, hopefully we're gonna see uh, a lot of things involving and uh, yeah, things we, we're heading there. I think so too. I, yeah, think so. I think I trust having access to a globally available private, I mean, pr uh, public ledger than more than looking at my Wells Fargo bank account and going, <laughs> <laughs> right? They've kind of proven that, uh, you know, I think I, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, I can definitely see that. I, I mean, I, that's one of the beauties of distributed ledger technology, right? Is that extra layer of security and trust. So yeah, I'm, I'm also ready for that too. So to change direction just a little bit, the world is scrambling right now to find places to fit blockchain technology in the everyday business. And again, it's because of distributed ledger technology. What industry would benefit the most from such trackable technology and what sort of chain would be necessary to suit everyday business? I mean, I think distributed ledger and blockchain will affect every industry, every vertical, and, and will touch every consumer within the next like five to 10 years. I really believe that. The easy enterprise use cases are supply chain management. Like you, we're talking to Toyota, and Toyota is like, we're going to put every VIN of every car on a blockchain. We're going to, you know, you talk about um, shipping industry. You talk about, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Trade finance. Like these things where there's there's ecosystems of partners that they can get a a consolidated view. That's a no-brainer. Um, but I think that those are. The, the enterprise use cases are interesting, but I think it's more interesting when you actually look at the new um, use cases that are going to happen you know, globally uh, that will open up much, much larger markets, w more focused, I think, even on the consumer side. Makes sense. Yeah. Right. I mean, I definitely think, I think as you say, we're see, we see a lot of enterprise use cases already, already taking hold, whether it's Walmart with their supply chain, right, which to your question is running on a fabric chain. Right, or you look at you look at Cisco, who's who's built their own chain in terms of tracking, you know, wanting to track counterfeit Cisco parts. Right, both of these are talking about sort of 
authenticating and tracking, whether it's a supply chain, whether it's Cisco's, right? It's making sure that, that things are verifiable, right? And making sure that we have an understanding and, and are able to authenticate what's on there. I think you can continue to see that. I don't know if it matters so much what protocol. I mean, like I said, you see, you see people using Fabric, you see people using Quorum, you see people, you know, which is a very the flavor of Ethereum, you see Cisco rolling their own. I don't know if that matters. I think what's probably more important is, is sort of getting the minds around it, getting, you know, what to me the big impediment is getting enterprise minds wrapped around, hey, we need to think of things in a different way. These are possibilities, right? I mean, and, and, and sort of what my colleague said, you know, they need to think, they need to get their mindset out of this is how it's always been and instead think this is what it could be. And I think that's actually the impediment. Yeah, I'm, I have to agree with both of you. I think that the, the main issue is finding um, the pains and how we can solve them. So if you think about it, again, going to the supply chain um, issues, think about a company like Gillette, for example. Uh, they got so many frauds, uh, so many, um, um, you know, stealing along the way. A lot of issues during, uh, from the from the moment that the you know the, the the goods are leaving the factory all the way to the store. Um, and I think that again, going back to what, where I started, um, having a big pain. Uh, that's where we're going to see the, the the fast solutions, um, and going forward from there. You guys got me thinking about something else. How how would this change the customer experience? You know, if enterprises, business were to util utilize this kind of technology, trackable technology, how would this change the the the, you know, the consumer experience? I mean, th so think about it. If you if FedEx, they just were on stage the other day. They're talking about putting everything on chain and then being able to have you know a record of. You know what do you see today in databases, but make that you know globally available, right? If you think about um, like today, if you call Netflix and you're like, "Hey, my Netflix isn't working," right? And you're like, "Yeah, sure, everything's okay." And you're like, "Well, it's not working for me. It must be me." But if they if companies start to actually put it out there, the infrastructure is on chain and it's transparent. You can actually say, "Hey, look, you know, there is an issue or what have you." So I think opening up that transparency into business processes and services and that are going to be built on you know, tr more transparent, well, I think we'll pull back the curtain on some of the opaqueness of existing institutions today and processes and services. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, think, I think we should probably split the world into two pieces on this and think of their, cha their internal chain uses, right? So a supply chain is probably very much more, much more internal use and their external uses, like in Netflix, or you know, like I guess when when people ask me, hey, what you know, why should people use blockchain? I always I always use like a Ticketmaster example, you know, as somebody who has who has bought fake tickets and tried to walk in and use them at a and been turned away at a Knicks game, right? You know, if, if all the tickets, if Ticketmaster put all the tickets on a chain, that would never happen. We never worry about you know buying something in StubHub and having it sold four times over, right? I mean, these are these are like concrete sort of examples from a consumer perspective where if you knew that what you were buying was real, that's valuable and you knew it instantly. No, no, no that, that's actually really good. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. And again, it's the, it's, it, the distributed ledger technology adds so much integrity, you know, and just in so many different levels. And accountability is one of my favorite things that it adds, you know, that's, that's, so it's a pretty big deal. You get me excited every time you talk about stuff like this. No, um, all right, so we're going to change directions a little bit more. I want to make things a little bit more interesting here. So Bitcoin is often talked about being a currency of crime, okay? It's easy to argue against that as every transaction is on a public ledger, and that's, that's my biggest argument. It's law enforcement's literal wet dream. Is, this wor is the world ready to use a currency that is decentralized but trackable by anyone who can browse the Internet? I think that the real currency of crime is the U.S. dollar, <laughs> right? Because it's not trackable and not traceable, right? Right. Like, right? So, um, you know, is the world ready? I think it's it's beautiful that you can have um, not have to carry a physical asset and you can have access to that asset from anywhere in the world and cross any border in the world and go through any airport with as much crypto as you want without it being, you know, it's, it's pretty much unstoppable, right. um, you know, but 
that doesn't speak to the crime question. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that Bitcoin is really the, cr the currency of crime. I think it, if you the total amount of crime you, is probably a very, very, very small fraction compared to what's done in just regular old greenbacks. Agreed. Yeah, um, I think that you know having tools like KYC and AML um, helping and and basically pushing uh, the people who's trying to do um, the wrong thing uh, with with the blockchain technology um, into the corners. And as we go and we evolved uh, during the years, um, more people are going to be again KYC and again the the wrong and and the things that are not supposed to be on. Um, on like anonymous um, will be taken care of. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, the US dollar has been, uh, you know, used, uh, you know, there, everybody knows that on every US dollar there's uh, leftovers of uh, cocaine. And it's, it's, it's well known that, you know, people bought all the worst thing in the world with the US dollar, so. Well, and I think about uh, US dollar compared to Bitcoin, I mean, there's, it's it's not a it's not even an argument if you go to uh, the, take for instance the U.S. border border agents are looking for U.S. dollars not Bitcoin right when was the last time you heard about a big Bitcoin stash that was taken <laughs> from a drug cartel you know I mean and that's an argument I've always felt that uh, was just not valid that public ledger is open to everyone to see the transactions that's that's the that's the worst nightmare for anyone trying to do something crazy illegal you know. And it's just an argument that I just felt was just never, never a good one. I've always felt like Bitcoin is a, in, in a lot of ways, I see Bitcoin as that already as a global currency. If you look around in this room right now, there's so many people from different countries, different walks of life, you know, different levels of, of financial, uh, um, um, of, how can you say, stability. But it brings so many different people together. I mean, I just don't see it as in any way something that can be call the currency a crime. I call it the people's currency. Now, China recently announced they will embrace blockchain technology and will even create their own currency. Do you think the U.S. will do the same? And what would it look like? I mean, well, I, I guess, I guess let, me, let me take that maybe in a slightly different direction. Like in, in chatting, with, chatting with my folks today at the booth, and I might argue that we already have sort of a U.S. version of maybe not a cryptocurrency, but an electronic currency, right? If I ask people in the room, how much cash do you carry? Do you use cash or do you just use plastic? Is everything electronic already? Are we, you know, and it's, it's not decentralized, but then again, you need to translate your, your Bitcoin back into dollars somewhere where it gets, you know, it gets tracked because it's not a medium of exchange, but maybe we're already, maybe we're already kind of halfway there. Right? I mean, I know when I asked like the the 23 year olds who, and 24 year olds in my booth if they had any cash, their answer was no. I'm a bit older, so I have a little bit of cash, but I still buy everything on a credit card. I think all of our banking is done electronically. Everything that we do is is already sort of done virtually, not cryptocurrency, but we're halfway there with virtual already. I would say. I, I agree with you on your debit card. It's basically a digital dollar. I, I, I'm highly skeptical that the U.S. government or the Federal Reserve would do a global crypto, a U.S. cryptocurrency because the Fed's been in the business of quantitative easing and devaluing our dollar. And if from 1973 to now, go take a chart, take an Excel spreadsheet and say one column dollar value, one column S&P value, take another column, divide the dollar value, divide S&P value by the dollar value, you'll find a flat line, which means they've literally just been printing money and they've eroded 95% of the value of our dollar. So it's not in their best interest to have a fixed amount of a currency that they can't devalue. That's their business model. That's how fractional banking works. That's how they control interest rates. It's not going to happen. Now with China, I think it's massive and I think it's more of a, um, there's a massive opportunity there that you have billions of people that are starting to now learn about cryptocurrency and learn about Bitcoin and learn about these new business models. Even if the Chinese government has their own cryptocurrency, it's going to be all the other, if that one rising tide is going to float all the other boats. So I think it's, we're in the most amazing time in our lives here um, and the opportunity is huge but I, I don't have a lot of confidence that the U.S. government's going to do the right thing. <laughs> and, and, yeah. uh, I'll take it to kind of a different uh, angle. Um, I think that we're kind of uh, in, a, in a war, um, China and the U.S., uh, where the U.S. Is, is definitely losing now. Um, 
the U.S. Uh, and you, you can see it. Um, and again, I'm not a big fan of, of Mark Zuckerberg or Libra, um, but you know, having the fact that instead of embracing it, learning it, understanding um, the future, um, you know, Congress people are, are spending their 10 minutes of glory uh, just bashing and, and not even uh, listening to the answer that, that Mark tried to give. Um, and I think that's a big mistake. Instead of trying to, to accept it, um, we're pushing it. Uh, projects are getting out of the U.S. instead of getting into the U.S. Um, and that's, that's a word that we don't want to lose at. That's uh, my opinion. Oh, I can go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually want to come out to, to make you happy. I'm going to come out with something that's probably pretty unpopular. But, All right, let's do it. But, 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 but here, here, I mean, here's my core question to, to my panelists, right? I mean, the essence of banking, the essence of finance, is, is changing the temporal nature of assets. Is lending today on a mortgage today, right? If I take a loan out, if you deposit money, they can lend me money, and you can still get your money because they can go to a lender of last resort and, and retrieve that to pay you back while I'm taking 30 years to pay my money back. In a, in a Bitcoin world, in a crypto world, you have no lender of last resort, which works fine until you have a, a, a confidence shock, until you have a crisis of confidence. And so I guess like fundamentally, you know, and I, and I, come, from a, I come from a Wall Street background. I was a currency and interest rate trader for 15 years, you know, um, and look at it from that perspective, I don't, like I fundamentally don't understand how, you know, how you can have an effective financial system without a lender of last resort. And if you guys, you know, I guess, you know, you're telling me that you're, we're gonna be, it's gonna be all Bitcoin, and I'm saying I don't see how that happens. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's gonna be all Bitcoin, I'm saying that there's, if you think about the, the major financial innovations, it was the creation of derivatives, it was securitization, it was digitization, and crypto is securitization, it is digitization, and it is um, enabling this kind of, um, th this whole ecosystem. I'm not saying that the Fed goes away, I'm just saying that there's, I don't think that they're gonna create a cryptocurrency because it's not in their best interest. <laughs> Oh, well, I mean, they may, they may, they're not going to create a yeah. finite amount, certainly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my first thought, right there. <laughs> my, my first thought and what you're saying, though, when we, when we think about the whole financial system and a lending system, it's actually what's led us all the way up to the point where we need quantitative easing to sustain those models, right? Because there's a lot of a lack of accountability. There's a huge, a, a huge problem of a, of a lack of accountability with the current financial models that we have. Bitcoin does, doesn't make things easier per se as far as continuing that model, so maybe we need to change that model. You know, maybe, maybe working with something that's along the lines of gold standard, which I know with how we work in our, in our finances, it, doesn't, it just doesn't fit. So maybe the solution is, all right, we have something that has a set amount and requires discipline. Maybe we have to take a more disciplined approach. Honestly speaking, I think the answer to that question will never come about until we get to a point to where we have to resort to a better currency. You know, I mean, I, I don't think there's going to be an answer to that until we have to resort to utilizing a different method. I think that, you know, let there be many, many assets and let the markets decide what does well and what doesn't, and, you know. Um, Rather than we can't just be one, right? <laughs> oh no! Well, I, I, yeah. like, like I said, I'm a you know I'm a Wall Street. I'm a free marketer. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you you are preaching to the choir when you when you say let the market decide. I mean, but like I said, I I guess right. I come at it where from my perspective, I see Bitcoin very you know as having a, a very definite future, a very definite role. I see cryptocurrency as having a very definite future, a definite role. I don't see it as 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 I see it as a, as a supporting role, as opposed to a primary role. I agree. Now, the people who determine these things are people that we, we vote for, right? So we're going to change directions just a little bit. So our current voting models come, from far more con uh, come with far more controversy, controversy, in my opinion, than cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. My question is, if we were to use blockchain technology for voting, would that improve our election process, utilizing distributed ledger technology, a trackable technology? 
Right. Um, again, I think it's going to bring a lot more uh, transparency. I think it's going to bring um, the voting um, to a higher um, rate of, of people that actually can vote. Um, obviously, there's a lot of things in order to solve it. Um, how are we going to do it? Uh, are we going to do it remote? Are we going to do it, um, it like it, in a place? Uh, how can we make sure the security size of, of everything will actually work? Um, but yeah, I definitely think that this is can be a, a, the next step for for improving the the voting system. Um, obviously, making sure that other countries can get in and, and affect that. I would say that doesn't end well. <laughs> I think that you're gonna in the U.S. Maybe that's okay, right? And I think it'd be amazing to say, hey, you can't cheat the election ballot, even though you can hack anything. But say you can't cheat the election ballot. But where it doesn't end well is in a small country where there's a, a new dictator in power that goes and says, give me everybody's name that ever voted against me or anybody that, you know, or voted for anybody I don't like. <laughs> and then all of a sudden doesn't end well. So that's scary because that's an immutable record of your intention and what your belief system is. I don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I, I definitely <laughs> agree with that. Right. I, I think there are also, there are probably questions like when you talk about that, and, 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 and you brought some of them up, is are we talking about, you know, wh wh at what point do we take the voting and do we put it on the chain? Are we asking people, are we letting people vote from home, you know, and, and use, your, use your ID, you know, use your, use your address? I mean, the reality is in this room, everybody, everybody has that access, but in America, my guess is an enormous proportion of people don't. Right and aren't able to do that, or are we are we letting them do that, and are we also letting them vote at voting booths and just tallying votes that way, right? Which is which then you're probably not really changing a whole heck of a lot. Maybe you're you're making recounts easier, but you're not increasing participation. Right. I don't think it'd be geared more towards the participation aspect, but to reduce the amount or reduce the likelihood that a, a recount would be necessary. So there you can't at the at the end of the poll can't question the integrity of the vote, right? You can't in, in, question the the quantity because it's there, right? And it's immutable. So I mean, but you do got a good point. I mean, outside of the US, I mean, could you imagine trying to use something like this in North Korea or something like that? I mean, that would just well, yeah. <laughs> the fly in the ointment on that is, you know, every summer there's a conference called DEFCON in Las Vegas, and last year at DEF CON, it's a security conference, and last year at DEF CON, they hacked the voting machines in like 15 minutes. Seriously? Yeah, and they're like, yeah, it, nation state, like a bunch of kids just hacked this. So the problem is the point of sale, if you will, with the actual vote, right? The where it's stored and how it's stored and the, it's immutable, that's a byproduct of the fact that the, the front door is wide open. Holy yeah, moly. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something we should probably have to consider, <laughs> you know, right. utilizing a, a, a better system of voting. So, the people that we vote in are responsible for our tax dollars. So, I have another question. This one's going to be fun. Might be fun to those in here who uh, are from the U.S. So, <clears throat> as we've discussed, blockchain creates a public ledger that can be tracked. No dark corners, no secrets. Should the United States government be required to use this technology when spending the tax dollar? Let me, let me rephrase, how about this? Why shouldn't the US government be required to utilize blockchain technology when spending the American tax dollar? I'm a fan. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm 100% behind that. 100%, I mean, um, we need to know where every dollar goes. I mean, living here in San Francisco, we pay so, much, so many taxes. Um, I wanna make sure like every other uh, citizen in this country uh, that we're spending our money wisely and not um, spending it the wrong way, uh, 100%. Yeah, it, it'll never happen, though, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're, we're way too cynical to believe that there, there's ever going to be that transparency, as much as everyone might like to know it and be able to see it. It's probably a national security issue, too. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean yeah. my next question is, I mean, what would, be, what would we be compromising by doing that, you know? I mean, would it be adding that extra level of integrity to our government and accountability? Is it worth the sacrifice of potentially na national security? I mean... Is the trade-off worth it? In my opinion, it is. I feel like the less dark corners we give those that we trust to lead us to hide in, the more likely they are to make better decisions. I'm a fan. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. But I think realistically, right? I mean, you could, you could. 
think of ways to solve the national security issue. Right? Just top of the head, right? I mean, creating it, creating it as, as, as you know, there will be some dark corners, right? There'll still be some some budgetary items that are that are large, large opaque boxes, which is fine, right? And people go, well, I know that's I know that's defense. I know that's but but knowing the amount is much different than knowing the use. But I mean, think of what our leaders think. What our leaders have to give up to do that. Right? For them to do that, they have to, they have to give up the ability to take care of their home districts, to, to push the military base where they want it, right? to push the contract where they want it. It's just not going to happen. So uh, I'm originally from Israel. Uh, national security is the easiest uh, kind of a trick in the book. Uh, for for not sharing information uh, with the people, basically, um, it's very easy to say, "Hey, we just throw uh, you know three hundred million dollars on a uh, you know plane or whatever it is," um, and there's no reason why not sharing it with everybody. Um, what I wanted to add also is that uh, basically uh, the the again going back to the tax, um, we need to make sure that our money is being spent. Uh, wisely, um, spending money and, and playing the, the national security card is, is the easiest way. We can always kind of uh, uh, put that aside, but if you go into the army, if you go to all these uh, places, there's so much inefficiency. Um, contractors are getting way over what they're supposed to get. Um, they work from, not from nine to six, they work from 10 to four, they leave early, um, they, they don't do their job that, that they're actually getting the money for, so. Yeah. Maybe they should put all the politicians' salaries on, on blockchain too. <laughs> their, or, their, their, their tax returns, not salaries, the tax returns. Or better right? yet, the, yeah. the lobbyists, right? I like that, yeah, right. <laughs> Campaigns, but we're you all- know, Follow that. the money, right? <laughs> That's right, follow the money, but imagine if the whole election system yeah. had to go through <laughs> Blockchain, right? Yeah. Uh, every lobbyist had to donate using right. a cryptocurrency, and it was all transparent. I mean, that would be a game changer. Talk about a extreme accountability and uh, a humbling effect all across the board. And I think, yeah. I mean, see, that's that's the thing is, is that's the beauty of blockchain. And I think we can all unanimously agree that our leaders, uh, we would all benefit greatly if our leaders and those who lead our countries and our economics, would, we would all greatly benefit from that. But it's so crazy is if you think about monitoring blockchain. Right. Instead of turning that that tool on themselves, they want to keep it focused on us. Right. Uh, in the earlier panel, they discussed Libra, and if you hear the discussions they had about Libra, it was just they wanted to make sure that they were, it was loaded questions to where nothing returned back on them. It was all <laughs> focused down there, and, and then most of it made zero sense. I think the true beauty of blockchain and monitoring comes from the top, our enterprises and our, 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 our politics, right, our governments. I think if we could actually have those systems in place, I think even like the traditional financial system might even correct itself if you can create transparency and accountability. I think the, uh, you know, with those watching that hearing with, with Zuckerberg on the stand, it was, I was embarrassed for the ignorance of some of the questions that were being asked because I just didn't get it. Right, they don't understand that Libra is actually a Swiss foundation. It's not Facebook, right. so, so it's just like, it, like it was pretty profound how, um, you know, unprepared they were with some of the questions that they asked. It was, it's disheartening. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you hit on it, right? The the ultimate value, right? This to me, the single greatest value of blockchain is transparency. And whether you're applying it to, to financial markets and financial transactions, whether you're applying it to supply chains, whether you're applying it to the government and how they spend our t collect and spend our tax dollars, that value is, is actually what's probably immutable of the whole thing, is the transparency. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. We're actually out of time. Harris, do you have anything else you want to close out with? No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys, it was, a, it was a good conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed and found it informative. Thanks again, guys. Awesome. Thank you Thank so you. much. We're actually gonna we're actually gonna blow through break. So if you there's five minutes left before our next speaker, if you guys want to open it up for questions. Chris, did you want to open up your panel for questions? We still have about five minutes before the next speaker. If if you like, yeah, I mean. Well, has anyone got any questions? Surely someone's got a question. 
I say I can't see if anyone has their hands raised or not. No? No questions? Well, I guess. I, as I say, I think must have covered everything. I guess it was a, a well-informed panel, right? That's that was good. It's a good sign. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right.